This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show with Lori Berenson, the once-imprisoned U.S. activist who's returned home from Peru after nearly two decades. Berenson's a former student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who left school to become an activist in the 80s in El Salvador during the Reagan years, then moved on to Peru. In 96, she was convicted of collaborating with the Tupac Amaru revolutionary movement in Peru. She was tried by a hooded military judge. Prosecutors used secret evidence against her. For three years, she was held at the frigid Yanomayo prison in the Andes mountains in an unheated open-air cell without running water. After a major outcry, she was transferred to the Socobaya prison in Arequipa, Peru. Lori Berenson was released on parole in 2010, but barred from leaving Peru for good until her sentence expired a few weeks ago. We are the first to interview Lori in the Socobaya prison, when she was there in 1999, and now the first to have an extended interview with her when she came home. I talked to her last week and asked how it feels to be free. It's wonderful to be here. I've been on parole for many years, which was similar to being free, but it's it's nice to be completely free. And to be back home in the United States for it's good. Ni it's, nice, it's nice to be with my family. It's nice to see old friends. It's nice to have the um, possibility of, of doing those things. What brought a young woman who is a freshman at MIT first to Salvador and then to Peru? I decided that I was not in agreement with the type of academia work I'd be able—you know, you could get, get a degree, and then you could become part of the system. And I thought that um, becoming part of the system somehow—you know, no, I mean, other people are able to use that to—and and do use it very well to the benefit of, of social justice, but others tend to be absorbed by the system. And I didn't want to be part of—absorbed by the system. I also, you know, had a very different— at the time, I sort of started seeing that the world is, has a lot less to do with what you learn in school than what you learn in life, and that the meaning of degrees is—shouldn't be that. So it was, in part, it was my, my way of saying, you know, I don't believe in this type of system. On the other hand, I, I wanted to support processes that, that sought to, to change what, at the time of this—this this was when the U.S. was um, supporting death squads and supporting, uh, you know, sending millions of dollars in military aid to bomb civilian population in El Salvador. So that, that was the context in which I decided to get involved. It's a very different context than when I go to Peru, but certainly in the case of El Salvador, that was a, a fundamental reason that brought me to that, was how could a, my government that talks about democracy be doing this? And so you went to Peru, and how soon after you were in Peru that you were arrested? I was arrested a year later. Explain what the MRTA was. The MRTA uh, is an organization that basically followed the example of, of the guerrilla movements of the 1960s in Peru and the rest of, of the continent, really. <laughs> the national liberation struggles. Um, it's, it, it forms out of different leftist organizations that actually were participating in uh, the efforts to return to democracy in uh, the early, the late 70s and early 80s, and they form um, an alternative guerrilla movement um, to what is the better known to the Shining Path, which had emerged um, publicly in 1980. And uh, it was a smaller organization, very similar to the organizations I am more familiar with in Central America. And when I got to Peru, I understood, in the case of the MRT, they were also. It's an organization. At the time that I got, there was nothing, no armed activities going on. And it was also an organization that seemed to be looking for a way out. It was deemed a terrorist organization by Peru? Well, everything was called terrorism in Peru. As well as the Shining yes, Path? Yes, it was, yes. Uh, and by the United States? At the time, I, I presume so, there wasn't a terrorist list. The terrorist list came out, I believe, in 98, if I'm not mistaken. But at the time of my um, arrival in Peru, there was not on any a formal list. It what was, was it about times. the MRTA that you were drawn to, that got you involved? They were very similar to the organizations I've been familiar with in Central America. But more than that, it was my sense that they were in a very difficult situation, a lot of people in prison, and they were looking for a way out. What do you mean, a way out? A way out, um, you know, in, in El Salvador, they had, there was a peace process. In other countries, there, in Guatemala, there was a peace process that, you know, there are moments in which you, you say, OK, so how do we resolve the situation? And it was a situation of dictatorship. So what do you do? You have an autocratic, you want to call it dictator or autocratic government um, that was not at all democratic. So it wasn't as if you could say, hey, we want to lay down our weapons and give ourselves in. I think they were looking for a way to, to do that to some, to some extent. I just—I didn't realize until after the embassy takeover, analyzing that, that that was how they were planning to, to find a way out.
Because when they took over the embassy, one of the things they talked about was um, di national dialogue. You know, it was a way—I I, I see it, you know, in retrospect. I think they were—that was the way out they were looking at. Explain the government at the time. So, in 1990, well, Alberto Fujimori wins the elections of 1990. Um, and uh, imply, uh, applies shock, a uh, shock program, um, in a, in a, uh, and applies a lot of dirty war tactics. Uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of intelligence used to carry out disappearances and in, 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 a, in a very selected disappearances. But you know, I'm talking about thousands of people were killed, um, and in, during that period. And in 1992, he has a self coup where he um, closes Congress, he closes restrictions on the press, a, a series of, uh, you know, lack of uh, rights to, pro to protest. And, in, and um, that is the, the Peru I knew. So, by the time I had gotten there, they had opened what they called, what is it, the say-say day. It was a, 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 some form of Congress. It was not the form that it had always existed, but it was whatever they, whatever his invent, inv whatever he invented. And it, there were elections. However, it was still within the framework of a constitution that was not, you know, it was a neoliberalism, and it was um, not exactly democracy. So let's go back to November 30th, 1995. Um, there are many people who are watching right now who were uh, not even born then. <laughs> so talk about what happened, why you were arrested, and what happened to you. Okay. Well, on that day, I was actually was uh, in that time I was doing some work in uh, as a journalist, and I was had gone to Congress. I was following a series of debates, actually a very important debate on narc. I was like narco houses or something, and I left Cong walking down the street, uh, took a bus, and I was pulled off the bus um, and shoved into a car by un um, un uniformed uh, policeman, and I was taken to a large office, which I later learned was the. Intelligence Police Office in the, the DNA uh, that was uh, the Dincote, and I was there. from there I was taken to the house uh, which I had helped rent um, time earlier, and uh, the shootout started. I was there all night when they were sh you know, during the shootout. I was, but I was in the police car, of course. The police held you in the car as a shootout took place oh, yeah, yeah, between yeah. the police and the MRTA. Yes, at the there. house that, that you uh, had uh, rent. And then I was after that. I was I was detained. Uh, I was tried by a, a, a hooded military tribunal that is, you know, not faced uh, very limited access to legal protection. Um, lawyers were allowed in. They didn't have access to the files. Um, uh, statements were made under duress. There was a wounded woman who was forced to declare in a very difficult state. So it was a difficult situation for all of those who were detained at the time. We were about 20 some odd people at that time. And uh, then I was sentenced to life, life in prison as a leader of the MRTA, which the basically the figure in uh, to be tried by a military tribunal was that if you weren't uh, detained in combat, then in order they, you had to be a leader to be tried by a military tribunal. So they decided to call me a leader. So that was uh, interesting. When you were brought out to the press, mm -hmm. is this is the image Peruvians have of you and anyone in the rest of the world for I'm the sure. next few decades? Yeah. Explain what you were told as you were brought out to the press. Okay, I, I was told that there was no microphone and that if I wanted to be heard, I had to uh, raise my voice. And um, I guess at the time I didn't think of the consequences. I mean, I think if I had said the same thing without looking angry saying it, they wouldn't have been able to use it. But you know, it's the it's the use of images. You take images from below towards you know, above. People look very big. And you can always catch an image when someone has their mouth open. So, you know, having the mouth open is enough, regardless of even if I spoke silently, you know, very quietly, if I had my mouth open, that would have been enough. Um, but they were able to use that image for till, till now. And you were told you had a very small amount of time, like a minute, to say whatever you needed to say? I believe so. I don't, I don't remember that exactly. What did you say? I said— And you had to speak in Spanish, of course. Okay. Well, I said that the MRT wasn't a, I didn't think it was a terrorist organization. Um, and I said there was—if they, if they, they existed, it was because there was a lot of injustice in the country. Um, and, and saying, basically, that if I was going to have to pay for that, I would. And that's what I did. So you were tried. Explain what this courtroom was like. What does it mean to be tried before a hooded judge? 
Um, I don't know if ours was similar to—I know of other cases that were actually rather different, but it was basically a three-phase trial. Uh, the first phase uh, was you were interrogated by the police, and then at some point the military started intervening. It was very difficult to tell which was the difference at the time. I, you know, these are things that I, I might have seen differently if I had known more. Um, but after that, there was a first phase. We were sentenced. We were all put in a room with hooded judges and hooded, uh, surrounded by soldiers. We were getting, given the sentences. And then uh, we were given two, I believe, two appeal trials in uh, these rooms with distorted—I uh, think one was in front of a judge, but there was—they tended to use these rooms with, like, distorted um, sound. So you'd be looking at a mirror. It was a sort of unusual. have distorted sound and images. And I think they, they filmed. Um, and uh, by the third, you know, sentence, they confirmed the life sentence. They changed some of the charges along the way, if I'm not mistaken. But it was it was all preposterous. It was based really on, on I'm not sure what, um, a lot of imagination. And what did they charge you with, and what were you convicted of? I, I was treason. I don't really remember. Um, like I said, being a, I was first convicted of being a leader of the MRTA, so I, I don't remember the exact charges, but they were—it was a long, with a laundry list. I, I mean, wanted to go back for one moment to mm -hmm. the time that I interviewed you in the Sokobaya uh -huh. prison. This was back in 1999. Did they present any evidence at the trial? No. Uh, in, the, in the actual trial, no. Absolutely nothing. Are you innocent of the charges? Yes, of the charges. Yes, I'm innocent of all the charges they've made against me. Which brings us to the U.S. and what the U.S. is doing here around your case, the U.S. government. What is the U.S. doing? Are they helping? There has been some pressure at certain times, but not uh, heavy pressure. Not heavy enough pressure, at least, because I'm still here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what do, do, you, do you think if they I mean, did I put could, pressure, you wouldn't be here? I mean, the U.S. I mean, administration? I think in the sense of more than the Congress in itself, I mean, all the military aid they give, and, and that kind of support. Yeah. And the, patting on the back of Fujimori every yeah, time that he does anything. I think yeah. he feels like he's fine. That was 1999. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that time in the Sokobaya prison? You'd been there. You'd been imprisoned at that point for, like, three years, uh, first at Yanomayo and then at the Sokobaya prison. Um, uh, the thing with Sokobaya, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the interview was when I was still in isolation. So I think it was difficult, because I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone. Um, it was, a, you know, in that sense, it was—you know, we weren't allowed to access the media. We weren't allowed to access to information. It was a very isolating experience. Um, uh, that, that is what I most remember about Sokabaya, was, was that aspect. And to people—of course, there have been millions of people imprisoned in the United States. But you now were imprisoned for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to an American audience about what that experience meant? Well, I think it's important, particularly in the United States, but it's also important in Peru, the, the issue of, of, of prisons as a space of justice or as a space of, of punishment. I think we'd have a much healthier society if we used imprisonment sparingly just so that people could learn from imprisonment and become have an opportunity to become to do something else, or to learn to, to, to learn to become productive, have the opportunity to be productive citizens. Unfortunately, in the United States and elsewhere, prisons are disproportionately um, disproportionately um, uh, with people of lower socioeconomic status. There is race and class involved. It, it, it's an issue in which you just see it's like social it, it, it's social struggle on 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 lines. You, you know, there are a lot of kids who get into gangs because that's the only option they see, and those kids could do other things if they had other options. So prisons could be a space in which that could happen. Or what it would usually happens is they just get they thrown in, they get they get tortured, they get beat up on, and they basically if they're not killed. They they're, they'll, they'll, they're not really. They, they don't really have a chance. And when they get out, they don't have a chance. So I don't. Th what kind of world do we live in, in which we exclude people instead of trying to find ways to include them? I mean, you know. And so that happens. Happens here. It happens in Peru. Dennis Jett is quoted as saying he was the ambassador mm, yes, to yeah. Peru at the time. What leverage do we have over Peru? He asked. I think this is a colonial, somewhat racist mentality that these countries are always wrong, and all we have to do is apply pressure on any under developed country. Um, he said, there's no way anyone can look at her story, referring to you, and conclude anything other than she knowingly, willingly and enthusiastically worked for a terrorist organization.
That quote from just last week, mm -hmm. the ambassador at the time of your arrest in mm -hmm. Peru, mm -hmm. your response? Well, I, you know, he has been very consistent in his responses on this. I do not agree with him. I do not think there was overwhelming proof of anything that he says. But, look, that that's his political position. It was not the position. Not everyone was patting Fujimori on the back. He was. Not every, not all of the ambassadors in Peru were doing that. Ambassador Jett also demanded I be fired for having interviewed you in the prison. <laughs> yeah. um, but your evaluation of Amnesty International saying something like 53 percent of the violence in the 80s could mm -hmm. be attributed to the Peruvian government, mm -hmm. 46 percent of the killing to Shining Path, 1 percent to the MRTA. Mm -hmm. I, I think the Truth Commission came up with similar statistics. I think it's really hard, because, I, first of all, I think the Truth Commission was developed as to start a process of memory and not to be the only thing that would come out and, it, like, it closed the book. So, um, you know, their, their conclusion was actually that The Shining Path had committed 54 percent um, and something like 35 percent to the state and 10 percent unknown, 1.5 percent to the MRTA, which seems a bit high, but that's it could be. I don't know. Um, I do think that if you know, the, the problems with understanding what happens also depends on how and when you ask it. If you go to a community in which the military is still there, it's highly probable they will not say the military did it. So, you know, those types of things, I think, will always be a problem when looking for tr truth. But I, I'm sure, you know, there, there have been horrific things have happened in Peru. And I think that's why I say I take responsibility for having collaborated with an organization that has committed crimes. I, I think that is, that is, and that's why I was in prison. So I think, you know, yes, it was secondary collaboration. I wasn't involved in any uh, specific act. But yes, I do, I do take my responsibility. I think those, um, at least in the case of the MRTA, all of the leadership has taken responsibility for their acts. They're they are, you know, that's because it's necessary. It's, it's, it's you know, that's that's how it, that it's like I said, it's unfortunate that that is not happening on all sides. I want to play a clip of your mother, Rhoda Berenson, and your father, Mark Berenson. We're asking everybody to remind President Bush uh, what he said in March and to remind him he's under an obligation if a U.S. citizen is wrongfully held in another country. There's a U.S. statute that says he must do everything in his power to release her. And the commission has essentially said Lori Berenson is wrongfully held. And this commission consists of seven respected internationally legal scholars and human rights scholars from seven different countries. President Bush, Lori is wrongfully held. It's time now to show backbone and strength and have the moral courage to do the right thing. If, if, if Ambassador Negroponte said a week ago that America takes care of its own, Lori Berenson is one of your own. She has suffered. She has wrong, been wronged. You know it. Secretary Powell knows it. Every person in this country of goodwill and understanding knows Lori Berenson has been wrong, and it's time to bring her home. What did that mean to you, um, the way your parents rallied around not only you, but rallied support in the United States, not only for your—around um, your imprisonment, but for the condition of people in Peru? I mean, I was—, I was um very surprised. Um, not, I just wasn't, you know, I don't come from a very political family. Um, I didn't expect um, their dedication. To some extent, it was—I it, felt, I felt very badly for it. Um, I, I still do, to a good extent, but I'm very grateful for it. They did an amazing—had uh, an amazing effort, and despite the fact we didn't have great communication. I think it was very difficult the first years for them, because they didn't have access to a lot of information. They didn't know what was really happening. And that made it—that sort of—some of the confusions, perhaps, in, in the way they interpreted things has to do with the lack of communication. So I think um, they, despite that, they did an amazing, an amazing thing. It's 20 years later. Um, uh, you have been in Peru, basically—I don't know if you call it under house arrest, but you were, you were not allowed to leave Peru um, from 2010 until now, and now you were just uh, allowed to leave. Would you do things the same way if we went back 20 years, but you know what you know now? Um, yes and no. I mean, when I go back to thinking, about, like, about education, if I had learned other skills, I might have been able to do some of the work I—maybe different types of work directly with populations that would have made my life very different. In that sense, I think I would have chosen to learn a little more before going to, to do things, you know, I learn uh, 
a skill that would have been more more useful. But in terms of doing it, I can't go. I can't deny my life. My life is what it was or what it is, and I. Um, I mean, yes, there are things that, when I reflect upon what happened and say, you know, I, I, I and, and that's part of the reason why I, I take responsibility for my actions and I apologize, because it's like, I do acknowledge that whether or not I am directly responsible for certain actions, there was horrific bloodshed in Peru, and I am very sorry it happened. So in that sense, um, understanding how, if I had known I was going to come and symbolize that, I might have thought twice before speaking. <laughs> Because you know, it's hard to symbolize horror, but on the other hand, it's like, you know, I wasn't— the objectives of certainly my own objectives and others' objectives were not to, to create horrific bloodshed, either. They were, you know, they were to, to achieve a, a more just society. And like, and I, like I said, I think it's, it's, it's important that those who have been involved on any side take responsibility for what they have done. And most, most, you know, on the, certainly on the side of the left, people paid, been in prison for a long time, and some are still there. Whereas on the case of, of the government forces, they continue to live in entire total impunity. Although interestingly, um, Alberto Fujimori, the president of Peru, is in jail. You used to wave your passport and say "feminista terrorista." <laughs> I didn't know. No. He would carry it with him. Yeah. But he ends up in jail. No, that, that is a bit ironic, yes. So, let's end with the issue of memory, something mm -hmm. you're very interested in mm -hmm. as you move forward in this country. Um, what does it mean to you, and what does acknowledgement and understanding the past— um, what do you think has to happen? Well, I think in, in, in any country, and this includes the U.S., if we deny that things happened or try to paint it over as if it wasn't that way, then the problems are more likely to either recur or at least just continue to be problems. If you start acknowledging them and say, hey, let's get a handle on this, we've got to see where our response, what the cause, you know, you, the root cause of, of violence in Peru, ha it has to do with structural violence. I mean, you, you know, regardless of whoever started first, it's not who started first. It's like, why on earth would something. I, would the violence have been so extreme had there not been uh, the type of structural violence that existed in Peru? It's a semi, it was semi-feudal in many ways, it's production, but not, not just production. It has to do with the social system of racism, of exclusion that, that existed into the 20th century. So, you know, that's not unique to Peru, but I think, in, in, I think what is, is told for, you know, should be told in, in general in, in, in the world is that, you know, it's better if you look, if you look at things you know, try to sit back and take a look at them. I think you could do much more than putting labels. When you put labels on people, you're saying it's the us-them. And when you say us-them, it's dangerous, because it makes you think that you're somehow superior to a, a quote, quote, a them. And I think that's one of the things that I really think came out in, in Peru, particularly in the case of my case and other people, is like, you want the them label, because you can sort of, all of your guilt, you can sort of transfer to other people. And it's like, that's not useful. You get, and you wind up having, you know, violence can escalate. It doesn't. It's not productive. It doesn't lead to anything. That's Laurie Berenson, the once imprisoned U.S. activist, home now after spending nearly two decades in prison and on parole in Peru. To see our coverage of Laurie over the years, go to democracynow.org. Special thanks to Mike Burke, Amy Littlefield, Juan Carlos Davila, Carla Wills, Dina Guzder, Renee Feltz, and Robbie Karen. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.